Well, tonight on the podcast, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest. Now, this special guest, you're pretty sure that you've saw her on many of the videos in Chicago. You know, she has been stomping very hard for black Americans with the migrant crisis. And I don't want to take too long to introduce, you know, our sister, Sister Kata Trust. So let's go ahead and bring her on the show. Thank you, Philip. How are you today? Hey, Sister Kata, uh, thank you very much for taking up the time to join us on the podcast. No problem. All right, so let me, let me ask you a question, you know, before, before we even get started, you know, how did you get involved with the situation with the migrants? Because, you know, like I said, prior to any of this, I personally, you know, haven't, you know, known who you were until this situation, but maybe some people also, you know, have noticed you and also all throughout the country, many people say, man, Chicago, they, they really doing this. So yeah, could you explain that to the people that may just not know? Well, let me just say this. I'm just a regular person here from the city of Chicago. I'm not a person that's known. And how I got involved with the migrant crisis is we got a phone call from our alderman letting us know that Amundsen Park, which is the park where my children grew up playing football, my, co my husband coached football and baseball at that park. We had a call saying that that park was going to be taken away from the community and used as a migrant shelter. And we immediately got on the phone. We started calling the people in the community. We called all of our elected officials. Uh, we called past and former players, coaches, parents, and we, you know, we're like, hey, listen, they're trying to take our park away. We're going to have to rally and pull ourselves together and um, try to see if we can prevent this from happening. OK, so you got out there and, and you start, you know, making some noise with this situation. Uh, but outside of the park or anybody else kind of rumbling about, hey, wait a minute, what's going on with this migrant situation? It, it, what, why is our community being targeted? Well, we had all been aware of, of the migrant crisis, but not um, as, you know, prolific about it until they, you know, again, when you start talking about taking away people's spaces and places, you know, that kind of changes the narrative of things. And when you talk about taking one of the crown jewels in the Austin community, and this is a place where our mayor, Brandon Johnson, you know, lives or says he lives, let me put it that way. And we were just like, you know, and, and because I kind of knew Brandon and had a relationship with him, so I thought um, my husband and I have both been park advocates for the last 30 years or more. And you would think that if something like this was happening, we would get a phone call and say, hey, listen, we are talking about bringing these migrants over here. You know, what do y'all think about this? Because if the brother had gave me a call, I'd have let him know, no, nah, brother, this ain't it right here. Don't do that. Um, he could have avoided a lot of headache, but, you know, he tends to want to run City Hall like he's a dictator and don't want to talk to the people. And so you get what you get. And I remember in one video you said that, you know, you had, you know, advocated for Brandon Johnson and you voted for him because I guess you had more of an issue with Lori Lightfoot. It, I wasn't really a Lori Lightfoot fan. Um, so what happened with Lori Lightfoot is my husband was a member of the Chicago Board of Education. Um, uh, Lori Lightfoot appointed him. And mm -hmm. um, because they had a difference of opinion about her wanting to take land that was uh, supposed to be used for um, low-income housing and giving it to a community that wanted a high school and not using it for what it was designated for, she, um, because he voted against it, uh, she kicked him off the board. So I was kind of done with her with that. And so then, you know, Brandon, like I said, because I knew him, um, not only did I support Brandon, I campaigned for Brandon and I gave Brandon money. And so, you know, I was like 10 toes down for him. But one thing about me, is if you gonna do the job, you better do the job right. I don't care who you are. I don't care how well I know you. I don't care if you my friend, you gotta be about your business. I stand on business. And when you show me that you not standing on business, I can't do, I can't buy, be bothered with you. I remember I did an interview with Troy LaRavie when I was in Chicago last time. And I asked him about Brandon Johnson and the brother said that you know, all y'all knew Brandon and that's why y'all supported him and say, and he was saying that what he's doing now, like you said, a lot of people, you know, even he said he was kind of shocked at see what Brandon Johnson is doing because they say from what he was telling me that Brandon Johnson was pretty solid prior to this. 
I'm not going to say he was solid. I'm going to say I was willing to give him a chance. Let me just say mm -hmm. that. You know, we tend to, and like I said, Brandon Johnson was a lesson um, for not just myself, but should be a lesson for black folks. And I, I say this now, you know, we have a tendency to vote for people because they look like us. We vote for people because they're Democrats. And, you know, traditionally, black people always support Democrats. And so we kind of go along with that. And one of the things that happened with Brandon Johnson was he was really a lesson to me and probably to other blacks that we can't just be out here voting for people because they look like us. And we definitely can't be supporting people just because they're Democrats, because Brandon Johnson, as well as President Biden, as well as our governor Pritzker, are showing us what the Democratic Party really feels about black people. So now it's time for us to stand up and say, you know what, mm -mm. we can't keep doing that anymore. And I think that one of the things that people have to understand is that we're not our great grandparents. We don't just go along to get along. This ain't that. If you cross us, we done. Period. You know, I, I've said on my show many times before, maybe you could, you know, maybe your story is a little different, but in the black community, the way my upbringing, we were raised to be Democrats, yeah. period. You know, white Jesus and Democrat. That's and, it. you know, if you can go out here and shoot up the block, go to jail, come back, everybody talking about give you a second chance, all your sins are washed by the blood of Jesus, but let you say you're not going to vote Democrat and they'll cast you out the black community. Yeah. And we still getting that. You think I don't hear that? You know. Oh, I, I know, know you getting it. Oh, I know you getting it. I was at an event um, where one of Congressman Danny K. Davis's uh, staff members was like, uh, what's this I hear about that Republican stuff? Girl, you better go on somewhere and sit down. I was like, look here. One of the great things about this country is we get to choose. And I am choosing to not mess with them Democrats anymore. Like I said, and, and it's not just me. We are, we're setting a trend. This is a wave and I'm like pushing it all across the city of Chicago, across the state if I can, because listen, let me tell you something. Biden can stop this crisis at the border whenever he gets ready to. Yes, he, he can. does not want to stop it. Okay, he doesn't exactly. want to stop it. The same way our mayor can say, you know what? I realized that we were a sanctuary city. We might need to rethink this. Now we're overwhelmed. You're going to the government begging for money to take care of migrants. Actually, the sanctuary city status does not really require us to take care of these people. All it does is means that we won't report you to ICE. So now we're taking on the baggage of having to take care of and support them. That's not what it's about. And then you here in the black community where you still have people who are suffering, we still have 61,000 people who were homeless before the migrants got here and we're not dealing with them. And we didn't make these people who then came from somewhere else a priority over them. And you okay with that? Let me tell you something. I was sitting in a meeting Thursday night with representatives from Chicago Public Schools who told us that we got a $391 million deficit. Can you imagine what we could have done with the money that we spent on the migrants already to support our schools? And you think we don't have, listen, listen. Nah, I ain't gonna be able to do it. And I'm not gonna be able to stand by and let my people continue to support a party that will not support its people. Now, now you just said 61,000, you know, homeless. What did Brandon Johnson do with them? Because in Chicago right now, it is dangerously cold. What, what, are all them in those shelters that, that he's, he's creating? Some of them are in shelters, but not to the extent that the migrants are. And you have to remember those people who were out there in the tents. We have never, we had a migrant, a, a, a homeless crisis before the migrants got here. There was never a time where they came along and put them up in hotels. There was never a time where there was a cry to ministers and, and churches to take these people in and let them sleep in your churches, even though there was an issue that the city wasn't well equipped to handle. It has never happened. We have a, a an affordable housing crisis crises here in the city of Chicago. You know, they are talk, they talk about the black flight. One of the reasons that there's a black flight in the city of Chicago is because of affordable housing. But now all of a sudden you are making housing readily available for the migrants. You didn't do this for the black folks who were suffering. 
Actually, and I'm not going to even say to black folks, we didn't do it for any of the people who were here in the city of Chicago suffering from homelessness. We weren't running out there trying to fill up shelters and create new shelters so that those people would have some place to go. Whatever happened to taking care of home first? And then recently, Brandon Johnson just found 90 plus million dollars of COVID funds. And he was, he all of a sudden, he found that money and wanted to use it for migrants. How, how do you, you know, feel about him finding this almost cold, you know, over $90 million and not using it for the people in Chicago, but using it for migrants? Well, first of all, he ain't found, well, let me not, I'm not going to swear. First of all, he didn't find anything. Mm -hmm. That money was there. And it was earmarked for a specific purpose. They just mm -hmm. diverted it the same way they're going to divert the rest of our tax dollars. Because here's the thing. If you're running to the government crying to bite the Biden administration that you don't have enough money to take care of these people, at some point it's going to trick you back, trickle down to the taxpayers here in the city of Chicago. And we're not naive to that fact. And as I said before, you know, black people can say that we need more investment in our communities. We need better investments in our schools. We want to see trade programs in our schools so that our kids who can't afford to go to college or who don't want to go to college are able to learn a trade and go on and work and be able to provide for themselves and for their families. We understand that those things cost money, but you find money for everything else, but you can't find money for our people. And let's not even deal with reparations and the fact that you got to have a commission for reparations. There was no commission when Biden wanted to send money to Ukraine. There was no commission when he wanted to send money over to Israel. And there's no commission on taking care of these migrants. So tell me why the hell you got to have a commission in order to do something for black people that's some bs to me yeah right now anybody i, I call it you know the the reparations commission scam because it's a scam at this point because they know we we got to see clearly even during COVID, right they spent trillions of dollars they didn't have no commission to do it and they that's just start putting money in people's hands so much so that people was, was was defrauding the government that's how much money they were throwing around but when it comes to our reparations you know, the, the we talking about the Democrats now. They're supposed to be our friends, right? <laughs> we, right. All, look, all of us were raised to be Democrats. All of us in the black community have voted Democrat, me included, right? But yet our friends say, basically, forget the black community. We 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 asking for an anti-black hate crime bill, but know what Biden do when he get in office? He gives it to the Asian community. Who won't even come out and vote for him right well, now? Them, and they, but you know what? And that's the same thing for the Latino community. You know, we, we're doing all of these things to support them. They don't really vote Democrat, not to the extent that they should, considering the Democratic Party is the one that really takes care of them, considering Obama went through all kinds of things to make life easier for the dreamers. But they don't really vote Democrat. Just well, on us. top of that, they don't want the migrants there either. They don't want them. No, 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 not at all. And, and, and let me tell you something. This shift that we're seeing, although it's very prevalent in the black community, it's not just us. Every People around this entire country are really having an issue with how the government is handling this. It's not just black people. But the reason that you are hearing from us is because our community is where they're being most prevalently placed. And that's our issue. That's our issue. I'll ask you a question about that $9,000 program they had where they was giving migrants $9,000 and basically setting them up in, in a home while black people get criticized if, if they get food stamps or section eight. We call lazy. We call all kinds of names. We had Brandon Johnson is giving people who didn't pay a dime of taxes in Chicago. Not a dime. Well, not, and you know what? It wasn't just $9,000. You got to think about this. They had job fairs that were specifically for them where they were hired on the spot. They not only giving them housing, giving them furniture, giving them clothing, um, and, 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 and providing needs for them that they didn't even provide for them. These people came here, they got cell phones, they got cars. You know, we still, we have some people who are seniors who are able to get the government phones, but our regular pookie them on the street, you, y'all, they can't get no cell phone. Our brothers who are, uh, are coming out from out of prison, you know, who are practicing recidivism. 
They're mm. not giving them work vouchers. They're not setting them up in jobs. They're not telling companies, hey, go ahead and hire them. And then, you know, the kicker about that part is we got these people coming over here. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they're criminals. We don't know if these if, if Venezuela has opened up their jails, which I heard, and let them out and just dispersing them over here. We don't know who we're getting. And we're bringing these people in. We're dropping them off in our communities. And if you drive class, some of the police stations and some of the shelters where these people are being housed, there's all kinds of crimes being committed. They're coming here selling drugs. They're committing crimes. They're turning to prostitution. And so you have these things right in the center of our already disinvested in communities. Make that Excuse me. Make it make sense. Make it well, make sense. Well, well, and I know, I know you're upset. Now, I trust me. I'm, I'm with you 100. percent So, but, 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 they mad at you when you talk about you don't want to vote Democrat in 2024. After you said all of that, they're mad at you. The other guy told you because you were talking about Republican. Who'd say you even talking about voting Republican? You mentioned it. Hey, I'm gonna try something else, or you can even try the couch. No, nah, I'm, 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 nah, I'm voting Republican. You vote Republican. All right, all right. So <laughs> no. let's get into that because, because, <laughs> oh, I, I want to hear it. Let me know why you want to vote for Republican. Because some black people, I, you know, I know where they at. And, and, and listen, I, I know our people. When you speak against the Democrat Party, you speaking against Big Mama. You speaking yep. against the grandpappy. You speaking against auntie, uncle, because we have been literally raised to be Democrats. So when you speak against Democrats, you're going against their upbringing. That's why you get so much pushback when you mention anything outside of that. But I, let, let me know your reasons why you say, you know what, I'm going to vote for the Republican Party. Here's my thing. What is the definition of insanity? The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. We've been voting Democrat as a people for how many years and Six how many plus. tries have we made if anything everything that is happening in our community has rolled backwards now let me let me make a point too to say that the republican party is not faultless in that but dag on it better the devil i know see i know how they feel about me you understand i know that they ain't really gonna rock with me the way that i would want them to rock with me but what I can respect is, is the fact that you're gonna tell me that, but you're not going to smile in my face and tell me that I'm down for you, but then everything that you're showing me is something different. And see, black people tend seem to forget that the crime bill, the war on drugs, welfare reform, all of those things that tore down our black families happened under the Democratic Party. We forget about that, which is why I did not support Hillary Clinton. Because my thing is this, that was your husband, but since you didn't stand up and say, hey man, listen, we can't do this to these people. We can't have that. You didn't, you didn't say anything. If anything, you probably doubled down on it. And so see, we have to think about those kinds of things. And when you think about that, and when you think about the fact that Clinton ran on being tough on crime and what tough on crime meant to our people. See, when you think about those kinds of things, it's not so hard to say, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. And the straw that broke the camel's back for me was when we showed up at City Hall in the hundreds, hundreds, and City Hall has never had that many black people show up at city council meetings in the history of this city. And when we all show up and we're saying to you, we want you to vote against the sanctuary city status. When we're saying to you, this is not okay with us. And you basically thumb your nose up at us. Oh, no, oh, no. And, 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 and then one, one more point to that. I came home and before I really started coming out against Brandon, and the Democratic Party, I called Brandon Johnson's office. I had a cell phone. It used to take him a couple of weeks to get back to me, but at some point he would call me back or send me a text. I called Brandon. I called Congressman Davis. I called my state representative. I called my state senator. I called my state 
congressman. And when I tell you, and these are people that I know, people that I've supported, people that I've gotten out and campaign for, so they know me. It ain't like I'm some person, you know, that's calling the office that they don't know. I didn't get a call back. It was radio silence. We out there fighting for our park other than the alderman, and that was only because he had to come because we was going to try and fetter his if he didn't. But other than our alderman, none of the other elected officials showed up. And see, my thing is, if you're not going to stand with us and stand up for us, or you got to do it in secret, no, I ain't with that. Because at some point, the politics can't just be about politics. It has to begin to be about the people. And so when you show me that you ain't about the people, I'm done messing with you. So now, since you want to vote for the Republican Party, what what part of the Republican Party you say, you know what, I can rock with that? Because, you know, some people go ask, well, why you want to go over there? Because they, like you said, they don't like us either. So why you, because that's what they'll tell me. Because I'm like, look, you know, if you want to, because I know our people, that's why I say, look, if you want to vote the cow's third party, my main issue is just don't vote for the Democrats. Because we know if they don't get at least 80% of the black vote, they're done. They have never won an election without black people. So even them sitting on the couch is a win, actually. Yeah. But what part of the Republican Party you say, yeah, yeah, I can rock with that? Well, you know what? Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I was a, quite a fan of McCain. Um, and I like Chris Christie. Um, I also, you know, um, I'm not a real big fan of, um, 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 the, the chick, but you know what? She a female, you know, let me see what it be about. Um, and, and, and not that I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm not that I'm a Trump fan. I'm kind of on the fence with the, with the Trump. Cause you know, he done done some stuff that, Got me looking at him a little cross that. But uh, but one thing I can say is we didn't have all these people coming in at the border. True now that wall, wait a minute, and that wall looking real good right about now. <laughs> yeah, see, see, you know, the mother candidates like Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, it's the couch for me. But it would I'm more so focused on policy than party because I'm politically independent. Yeah, so yeah. I would say the reason why I would say, you know, I, I would me personally due to the migrant crisis, Trump has a, a history of getting them on out of here. He has yeah. a history of it. We can't, the other candidates haven't had a history of doing that. Right. Yeah. Um, Trump had a history of, you know, helping businesses, um, lowering, giving tax cuts, especially if you got a business, right. Uh, yeah. You you're going to like Trump for that reason. Uh, Trump, you know, he did the stimulus checks. He even got people like rappers and, and all that. People say, yeah, at least with Trump, I had the average person said they had more money during the time of the Trump administration than now. They've actually lost a lot of money yeah. because because the economy is just not the migrants. It's the economy, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm I'm talking to black people and they saying, look, I don't like all that stuff Trump got going on sometime. And man, he be saying stuff I don't like, but doggone it. I had some bread with Trump and I'm willing to because listen, I, I'll tell people this. In America, we're going to deal with some racism. I'd rather yeah. deal with racism and have some paper to defend myself and be broke and deal with it. Look here. And that's what, so, and see, that's what you have young people saying now. Man, listen, under Trump, I ain't good. Under yep. Trump, I could go to the store and I can buy a steak. Now you can't, we can't, eat. look, as black folks, you know we love us some neck bones. We can't even afford to buy neck bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on now. Have you been to the grocery store lately? Yes, I have. And it's crazy. That's why that's why it made me really start going to like before I didn't go to Whole Foods to shop. I would go like to Kroger and it was a store in Texas or HEB. But I stopped going to those stores. And say, I might want to go to Whole Foods because the, the, the prices in the grocery stores yeah. today is Whole Food prices. Yeah. You might want to go to Whole Foods and shop. Yeah. And, it's and that so bad. Just think about we work every day. Well, I'm retired, but for people who work every day, who are trying to support families, you really are having a tough time, you know, trying to eat. And then you got to think about during the pandemic. So, cause we're coming out of the pandemic where the government was giving people um, money for food, where they were getting, a, you know, a little stimulus um, in the mail every couple of months. 
And so now you have people who are coming out of the pandemic, looking at the economy the way that it is. And so you have people who are poor, who are struggling. And see, they're not given the same monies that they were giving them for uh, Link and uh, for, for poor people now. That stuff is going to the migrants. Regular people can't even get it anymore. And, and so when you talk about Trump, hey, if, yeah, you got a lot of black people, especially younger people who are saying, you know what? Yeah, Biden, you ain't it. We are, our people are hurting. Our people are hurting right now. If you, if you work minimum wage, if you uh, are just above minimum wage, and you're barely scraping by, you're hurting. You're trying to decide whether you're going to pay rent or buy groceries. Oh, yeah. And, and Sister Cotta, did you see that video? Um, I did a podcast on it last night where you had a uh, a, a migrant calling a sister um, saying that she no money for you and, and calling her lazy. Did you see that video? I did. I did. But see, you know, there are those stereotypes. And I was talking to someone the other day that, you know, and, and that's why reparations are so important because, see, people will look at black people and they will say that they're lazy. But there are so many generational situations that play into the structure of a family or the breakdown of the family. You know, we are still dealing with the effects of, like I said, that crime bill and that war on drugs, black families are still dealing with the effects of that. And so we had a couple of years ago where you heard Clinton came back and say, oh, well, damn, I'm sorry. You know, that really did hurt. Sorry? What the hell does sorry fix? Now you sorry? You've destroyed generations. And those are things that we can't get back. You peripherated the one parent household. You did that. And now we're wondering why we still have grandmothers and grandfathers raising children. You did it. You did it. And we're still trying to recover from that. The way that they've come in and dismantled our schools, watered down the education that our kids were getting. And then you wonder why Johnny can't read. You messed up Johnny's mother and father being able to read to him at night. So when does society take responsibility for what they've caused? When does oh, you mentioned Well, you mentioned our first black president. It wasn't Barack Obama. Bill Clinton was our first black president. You remember that asinine things that black people say in the 92? I ain't never say that, but yeah, I remember it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't say you, but I'm saying I remember and I and it never sat well with me. Say, oh, I said, why y'all saying that man black? Oh, because he played a saxophone and he smoked weed. Like, really? I mean, and, but but that's what your first black president did is is help mass incarcerate you with the help of uh, of Joe Biden, the other person yeah. they voted for, right? That's right. My lord. But you know the, the lazy thing. Let me get get back to that. We became lazy when we got off the plantation. Yeah. Anytime we wanted money for our, proper money for our labor, you know, even now, right? That, that migrant they call that sister lazy and say, well, well, you if if I'm lazy because I don't want to take a job working seven dollars an hour when I should get paid twenty, I'll be lazy all day long. You Baby. can go do that job if you want to, but I we'd have done our time as slaves. We ain't gonna work for free no more. That's it. And then I think that you know one of the things is is the, with the, the the term lazy is one of those terms that is used to demonize us. And that's all it is. It's a way of demonizing us. It's a way of, of painting a narrative. Most black people are some of the most hardworking people you'll ever meet in your life. Our ancestors were always called lazy, even after coming out and working 16 and 18 hour days in the field for a white man and not giving money. But if you didn't do it fast enough and if you didn't do it the way they wanted you to do it, then you were stereotyped as lazy. So that's just another one of those things that she probably heard somebody else say. But my thing is, hell, I could say you lazy. You didn't came all the way over here from another country to get the milk and honey that I should be getting. And you want to call me lazy? See, but mm, she got the Yeah, right but see, <laughs> that's the funny part. <laughs> you so hard working, but you, you can't do it in your homeland? That part. Now, like, why would you leave your homeland? If you that hard working, then 
your homeland should be way better than here because you're a hard worker, right? You come into a land with a bunch of lazy people. That's what our people got to start telling them. If you're so hard working, then why you didn't do it back over there? That's and then what, what, what makes me upset, and I still keep talking about this, we're letting all these military age males cross that border, not women and children, a bunch of males. And you talking about crime? It is, yeah, you, the women probably be out there selling themselves on the blade somewhere, but all them men that are in here, I'm, I'm telling y'all, sister, it's going to be a problem in the next couple of years with all them you know men what? in here. Look at what happened in California. It's not, and it's not going to be that far off. Um, look at what or happened LA in, in particular. Watts. Go back and look at what happened in Watts um, two years ago when those communities began to change and they started running those black folks out of there. Because remember, they dropped them in our communities. It ain't like they got to go someplace and come there. This is where they are, okay? And so when you talk about those war-age men, you talk about the fact that some of them may be criminals because we see the criminal acts. We see them in store stealing. You know, these are things that we're seeing. So at what point does it become something else? Because they already walk around here like they think they're better than us. And so when you have a group of people who think they're better than the people that are already there, I mean, you know, just think about what happened. But I think that they have to understand that we're a little different over here, especially in Chicago. You run up, you're going to get done up. And, and I'm glad y'all are fighting back because, you know, we, we talked about that on the podcast where Los Angeles, California is the perfect, you know, case study for black America. What happens when you don't say nothing? What happens when you don't fight back? And what ended up happening? Black America literally was kicked out of kicked Los out. Angeles. I mean, they own outside cities and they went to Nevada. But California, I mean, everybody's running out of that state. I mean, if you want to know Democrat policies, look at California. the One of the worst states ever. Beautiful, beautiful environment, but just horrible. Horrible. In the homeless situation over there, Sister, I, oh my God, I, I've seen some things I've never seen before with homeless over there. And, and a lot of mental health issues is out there. Like, oh, man. Well, speaking, let's talk about mental health. I was looking at a podcast or interview that Brandon Johnson did the other day. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how, well, you know what? I had this whole mental health uh, commission because mental health is really important to me. And we're up and we're running and we're ready to go. And the reporter asked her, asked him, she said, well, so are you going to open some mental health clinics uh, for the, for the residents of Chicago? And he was like, oh yes, we're going to do that. You know, I have my people, they're identified, they're ready to move. They're out on the street, out on the ground. So she said, well, where are the centers going to be opened up at? Well, we haven't decided that. Well, how the hell is it up and running if you don't even know where you're going to have them at? It's just stuff like that. That rhetoric. They they have become so accustomed to saying what they think people want to hear that you don't think people are going to pay attention to it. Because my thing is, how's it up and running? And how have you identified how you're going to handle the situation if you don't even have a place established yet for the people to go? So you got a whole mental health staff that's not working? What sense does that make? That's more that more that Democrat word salad that they they they've been so used to doing that for years and we fall for it. Or they are singing our churches or they'll say hope and change, you know, all that sort of thing. And we fall for it. But now we live in the information age. And now, like you said, we are a new group of people now. And that's not going to work no more. You got to bring some tangible resources to the black community, just like you've given to those migrants. Matter of fact, you got to give now double and triple resources now because yeah, what you gave to the migrants, exactly oh no. What they got. And for every black family in the city of Chicago, we want what they got. Whatever you gave them, that's what we want. And we ain't accepting anything less. We are absolutely not accepting anything less. And that's like he, you know, when he realized that black folks was upset with him, he went and got the black preachers and went and got the head of the NAACP. And and I'm like, you the one that got the, we, we don't listen to them. We don't, they, that, that don't mean nothing to us. You the one that got these black ministers. We, we, we stopped listening to them at the king died. 
I said that so many times. It's like when I see Brandon Johnson with the, I say when I seen the NAACP, I said really the NAACP Dang. preachers, the people who have no credibility in the black community. That's who nah, you surround yourself nah. with instead of trying to break bread to grassroots. Do what's right by black people, and then but see, this is what happened. These black politicians, they get in good with the Democrats and they do their people wrong. What's going to end up happening? Them same Democrats gonna turn on Brandon Johnson, and he's gonna be out there by himself and no community support. Why? Just gonna happen. Oh, hell they already turning on him. I'm like, because every time they turn on Fox and see me, <laughs> they already turning on him. Because it's like, look here. Y'all gonna have to go sit down with Miss Trust. Y'all gonna have to figure it out. Y'all gonna have to work it out. <laughs> we need y'all to go somewhere and sit down because people are listening. Well, nope, I'm not going nowhere to sit down. I'm out here. You already messed up. Too bad, so sad. We and, and he's already paying for it. He's already paying for it because people are listening. People are all across the country are now paying attention. And now nah, we ain't taking none of that BS y'all selling. And that's for no. the entire Democratic Party. I listened to Governor Prisca the other day um, on uh, Meet the Press and talking about uh, Biden's numbers. And, well, you know, the black people are really just not feeling Biden. And he's sitting up there tap dancing because, you know, he wants to be next in line. And we ain't voting for his. No, we're not supporting none of y'all. Nope. Go on somewhere and sit down. We're done. I seen your governor begging, begging my governor in Texas, Greg Abbott. Begging him to stop sending the buses. Why he would beg, he? he said, please stop sending them. Why and, would he? Why would he? Y'all said that y'all were a sanctuary city. It did, ain't that what we said? We said we're the city of big shoulders. And I really remember before Brandon got in, Lori was like, well, send them then. You know, we can take it. You know, y'all stood up there and talked all that smack. And now you're scrambling. Now your people looking at you cross-eyed and you don't know what to do. Because there's going to be a price to pay for this. And they're all going to pay it. They're all going to pay it. They're all going to pay it. We're not taking this sitting down. We're tired. We're not going along to get along no more. Let me ask you this question about the, you know, the uh, one of your aldermen, I forgot the brother's name, that put up the resolution to, um, and I forgot that brother's name. I see his face, but I forgot his name. And he put the resolution to get Sanctuary City put on the ballot for Anthony March. Anthony Bill, I was there at City Okay, Hall Anthony Bill, that's the brother. And he put it up, and they end up shooting it down. And I mean, what kind of response what was from the community? Because it seemed like everybody would wanted that to be put on the ballot. So let me tell you, that was some that was something else. And that day we had the votes. We had the votes. And I don't know, I think at that time, Brandon was in uh, Washington begging for money. So he wasn't in the city council meeting. So I'm sure that um, the alderman who came up against him had him on, he had him on the phone and he was trying to tell him to stall the vote. So what they ended up doing was stalling the vote um, for and uh, put it, postponing the vote. So we were all there in city hall chambers. And let me tell you something. I told you we were there by the hundreds. So let me tell you what this what this man did. So one of the first things he did was he made it seem like we were there, we were disruptive, and the aldermen that were on the floor were afraid of us. So what they decided to do was they passed the ordinance to keep the people from coming into city hall chambers during city council meetings. So now only way you can come into the city hall chambers is if you are a guest invited by the mayor. So wow. without us being able to be there, to be in the chambers, to speak out and to speak against it, they were able to kind of bully some of the other aldermen into voting the way that they want to. Oh, some of them, they were bullied in there. Some of, some of them are just Uncle Tom's and they just going to do what they told, you know. So I ain't going to say that all of them were bullied. Some of them were happy to go along with the, with the status quo but they end up voting it down. But you know what? We're not done with that because, you know, we can always go ward by ward and do our own ordinance, which is what we're working on doing. Oh, y'all think are anybody talking about filing lawsuits against Brandon Johnson for that? Because how I looked at it is that that is not democracy. Cause you know, Democrats always talking about, we need to save democracy, Baby. but that Baby. is authoritarianism. What yes, they did. It is. Yes, it is. And yes, we are. Yes, we are working on that. Yes. 
Um, um, so there's, um, we're looking at some things with the Unfair Meetings Act. Um, so we're looking at doing some things about that. Yes, there are, we are, yeah, we, look, let me tell you something. When I tell you we ain't let none slide, we ain't let none slide. Not nothing. Nothing. It would be so much easier, Brandon John, say, okay, okay. Those people don't want Sanctuary City. We done. Sanctuary City status is done. Greg Abbott, hey, look, we're not a Sanctuary City no more. Send them somewhere else. We don't want them here. I'm pretty sure he'll say, okay, no problem. I'll start sending them to other places, right? But they just want to hold on to that Democrat thing. Come on, our values, our values. That pride is a strange bedfellow because I've said that often. What's wrong with saying, hey, you know what? I made a mistake. I need to rethink this. Because it's clear to everybody but you that you, you done messed up. It's clear to everybody but you. And if you ask any single person in the city of Chicago about Mayor Johnson, the first thing they say is one-term mayor. They can't wait to get rid of him. And instead of saying, I made a mistake, let me see how I can fix this. You double down on it because you too sick to swallow your pride and say you made a mistake. You, you messed up. You know that ain't the word I want to use, but yeah. you messed up. <laughs> well, well, messed well, up. well, let me, let me, well, you, you know, I looked at y'all laws and, you know, y'all can recall him. Y'all don't have no, to wait. For his... It's not quite that simple. And we've been oh. looking at that too. Uh-huh. Well, uh huh. Well, you're talking about the Laquan McDonald law. Yes. But there, yeah. Um, look, let me tell you something. If it was that simple, he, that part, that part probably be gone already. Um, there was some loopholes in that. Um, but we are looking um to do some addendums to that law so that we can recall. Yes. Well, boy, Brandon Johnson, he better get it. He better get his act together. You know, and maybe one way he can get his act together is get a new haircut. That that haircut. Uh, that haircut. You know Ugh. what? I can't see past the BS to even look at his hair. I couldn't even tell you what his hair looks like. <laughs> I guess I look at him in the media a little bit more than some of the BS because I don't live in the city. You know, or thing, you know, like I said, Chicago's beautiful. Me and my wife, you know, we went to Chicago back in October. She enjoyed it. You know, it, I, mean, I love going to Chicago. My kids want to go. Yeah, bring her back so we can hook up and, and you know, hang like wet clothes. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no doubt. Next time I be in Chicago, I definitely, you know, let you know. But, but, but Sister Kata, you know, if if, if people may want to, you know, contact you or maybe ask some questions, you know, how how can they do that? Uh, my email address is c a t a underscore t r u s s at sbcglobal.net. Um, you can contact me on Facebook, in, Instagram. Um, just message me, DM me. Um, I'm happy to talk to people, happy to get the word out, happy to say to people, listen, I'm all for it. If you don't want to vote Republican, because I know some black folks might have a problem with that, stay home. Don't get wrapped up into that, oh, your ancestors died, so you can have the right to vote. You got to show, because see, they they going to guilt us with all that other, that mess, that noise. No, no, because it's. Now is the time for us to send a message to the Democratic Party that you're not going to keep playing in our faces. We're not going to continue to show up for people that are not showing up for us. Period. That's why that's why I tell them, you know, OK, if you don't want to vote Republicans, fine. Vote for the couch. Yep, that's it. But Sister Kata, thank you for joining us today. I greatly appreciate it. Like I said, I hope, hope you come back. You know, again, and bring it. You you always welcome to come back and, and, and share us updates what's going on in Chicago. You know, you you free to you, to, to say anything you need to say um, about that. Get a message out of it. Trust me, they listening. Oh, they listening. Trust me, they listening. Lee, you know, I think that we have to, as Black people, get out of the habit of doing what we've done in the past, doing the norm, going with the norm. You want something different, you got to do something different. And I think that we as a people have to begin to stand up for ourselves. We have to begin to vote our self-interest. We actually have to figure out what our self-interests are and what they look like. You know, I remember um, when Tavis Smiley was really big and Obama was in office and Tavis was talking about, we need a plan for black America. We need a plan for ourselves. And they tarred and feathered that brother. And now you look at where we are today, 
Had we had a plan for Black America, had we had a plan for how to develop our communities, how to become self-sufficient, how, be, how to become self-reliant, had we had a plan, we wouldn't be where we are today. We have to come up with a plan for ourselves, and it has to be us. We can't expect anybody to do it. Ain't nobody coming around waving the white flag to save us. That's happening no more. We got to save ourselves. They said we, we thank you, Sister Carter, for coming on the show today. You greatly appreciate it. And uh, definitely, definitely, definitely. Like I said, you can come back at any time. Uh, you, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.